Hello everyone. My milling machine is an Alexander Master Toolmaker milling machine. Now the nice thing about this milling machine are there's lots of accessories available to fit onto it. Now I need to do a job where I need a high speed vertical head. Now the vertical head that's on the machine at the moment is powered by a motor actually within the milling machine itself. This other head, the, uh, the high speed head, it doesn't use that motor, it uses its own standalone motor. In fact, it sits on top of the, the head. And that motor is just here. Now, the previous owner of the milling machine, he didn't have any three phase uh, power available in his workshop. So he fitted this motor to the head, uh, which is a single phase motor. Um, luckily, he didn't dispose of the original one. Now, I want to put this original one back on. Uh, the first reason I want to do this is because it looks really nice. It's a beautiful, beautiful looking motor. Uh, the other thing is this is three phase. So if I run this through an inverter, that means that I can control its speed with the knob on the side of the inverter. And that's great for setting up the cutter speed once we're on the mill. However, this, uh, this motor hasn't been used for 20 plus years. So I want to take it apart, clean the bearings out, repack them with grease. Well, I'm going to check the bearings, repack them with grease and then put it together. Now, I happen to know that I won't need to check the, uh, the bearings because I've had this apart already and it's rebuilt, but shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> anyway, let's go back a week in the past and we will see me rebuilding this motor. Now it's going to start with me about to switch it on to see if it works. Right, I think the first thing we need to do is check to see that our motor still runs. Now this was used uh, last in a, a proper factory that had 415 volts three phase. We're in the UK here. The box that I've got it connected to, this here is an inverter. Now this is an inverter that runs from the mains. This produces three phase, but it produces three phase at 230 volts. Now the motor was configured in in star for running on 415 volts. We're going to be running on 213, uh, sorry, 230. So we need to change the configuration to Delta. And you do that with the connections within the motor here. And I've taken care of that. Now, if you need to change these connections, if you're doing something like this at home, make sure you get the right connections. Talk to somebody who knows, because if you mess up the configurations, you can damage your inverter or you can damage the motor. So it's really important to get those things correct. Right, so we're connected up. I'm now going to switch on the mains power, which will produce a three phase and hopefully our motor will burst into life. Here we go. Now it's not going very fast. See, it's going really quite slow. Now, one of the nice things about using an inverter is you can change its power settings. So if I turn the knob up, the speed of the motor increases. This tops out at about 2,800 RPM. and then comes down to, you can actually stop it on the, on the control knob. So we know that our motor runs. Woohoo! Now we know the motor still works electrically, let's give it a bit of a clean and start to disassemble it. To make the motor more stable and stop it rolling around, I stand it on two pieces of wood. I take lots of pictures as I work on a job. It's quite amazing how useful the safe pictures can be. It reminds you where everything should go when you're reassembling, and you've got a log showing how the item come apart that you can use in the future. The first thing I remove is the bearing cover on the rear of the motor. It's held in place by two long 2BA screws. I was expecting the screws to be screwed into the motor housing, but as you can see, the screws are too long, and they seem to secure to something inside the motor. We'll see what that is a little later. The grease is old and very thick. I dig out what I can, and the more I dig out now, the less I need to wash out later. Inside the cover, there are two wave washers, one on top of the other. You can see them just there. These washers apply a preload to the outside race of the bearing. It keeps the bearing and the rotor in its correct position. Once more, old grease is cleared. This shim can be removed. It normally sits between the outer race of the bearing and the two wave washers. There is a housing at the front of the motor and another at the rear. Each of these housings are attached to the motor stator, that's the main body of the motor, by four screws each. I remove all eight screws. 
The rear motor housing has three tabs around its outside edge. These tabs enable a three-legged extractor to be used to pull against the cover and push against the end of the motor spindle. I'd warmed the cover with a heat gun and the cover slipped off the bearing easily with just finger pressure on the extractor's centre bolt. Now the rotor and front cover can be pulled out of the body of the motor. The bearing cover at the front of the motor is also held in position by two long 2BA screws. I remove the screws and the front bearing cover. I heat the front cover with a hot air gun. It pulls off the bearing quite easily using just my hands. The rotor is free. The inner races of the two bearings are still tight on the rotor shaft, but there's plenty of room to wash them out, so I'm going to leave them where they are and not disturb them. Now, do you remember those long 2BA screws that held the bearing covers in place? We wondered what they screwed into. Well, between the bearing and the rotor is the inner bearing cover. It's this the 2BA screws screw into. Now, can you see a problem here? How are we going to hold up these covers in the correct position, pushed against the underside of the bearing, if they're inside the motor and we can't touch them? There is in fact an easy answer, and I'll show you what it is as I assemble the motor a little later. I pour some clean petrol into a tub. The workshop door is open to let the fumes out and the fresh air in. Now, using a clean paintbrush, I wash the bearings out twice with clean petrol each time. To make sure the bearings are clean, turn them around slowly with your fingers. There shouldn't be any clicks or tight spots. If there are, then there's still muck in the bearing. Wash the bearing out again with more clean petrol and turn them again slowly with your hands. Keep doing this until the ball race has turned freely. Don't spin them fast. If there is any muck in there, say a grain of sand, it could damage the surface of the race or the balls. And that's not good. Using more petrol, I clean the two end castings of the motor and the motor body itself. I've removed the grease nipples from the bearing covers and pumped fresh grease through them. Where the nipples fit into the covers, all the old grease has been removed. The nipples are replaced and fresh grease pumped through them to fill all the voids in the cover. What type of grease should we use to pack our motor bearings? The first thing you should do is look through the manual of the machine you're working on. This may say which grease to use, and it makes sense to use it if it's still available. My Alexander is old. The manual doesn't state a grease type for the motor bearings. I normally use Castrol LM grease on bearings. I've used this grease in car and motorbike wheel bearings for over 40 years, and I've never had a problem. This is my go-to bearing grease, and I'll be using it in this motor's bearings. How much grease do you place inside the bearing? Do not completely fill the bearing with grease. If you do, there's a good chance the bearing will run hot, as it needs to push all that extra grease around inside the bearing all the time. Also, as the grease warms up, it will expand. If there's no room for the expanding grease to go, it will ooze out of any gap it can find. I've seen figures from 30% full to 75% full. I normally estimate just under 50%, and that hasn't given me any problems. If the manual tells you an exact amount, follow the manual. I wipe some grease onto the rear of the bearings. Now I use a heat gun to heat the front casting of the motor, and the bearings slip nicely into place. Grease the front of the bearings to just under 50% full, and fit the bearing cover. With this front bearing, I can get my hands inside the motor and hold the plate where the 2BA screws need to screw into. It's an easy job to fit the screws, and I tighten them up. On to the second bearing. I clean all the jointing surfaces between the motor body and the end castings. Using the photos taken before the motor came apart, I can see where to position the motor body on the front casting. I wipe a little grease to the underside of the bearings with my finger. The end casting is heated with a hot air gun. The mating surfaces of the bearing and the end castings have been lubricated with a small wiper grease. The end casting slides easily onto the bearing. Now, once the end casting is in position, I place grease on the top surface of the bearing. I need to fit the bearing cap. That cap is held in position by two 2BA screws. The screws will not be long enough to reach the inner bearing cover that's now sitting on the top of the rotor. The trick here is to use two lengths of 2BA studding screwed into the inner bearing cover and protruding out through the fixing holes. 
Now, once the end casting is moved into its correct position on the motor body, all you have to do is lift the inner bearing cover using the two lengths of 2BA studding. Once the cover is in the correct position, hold it up with one of the lengths of studding. Remove the second length and fit one of the screws. Lightly tighten that screw until it supports the inner bearing cover. Remove the second piece of studding and replace it with the second screw. Tighten the screws and the bearing cap is fitted. There are now eight screws and nuts to fit that hold the top and bottom castings onto the motor body. Once they are fitted, the motor is now reassembled. And the motor is back together again. Now the bearings have been washed out and repacked with grease. I've reconnected the three-phase motor to the inverter. Uh, now I don't think I said last time, but I've just used a piece of normal single-phase mains cable here. So the colours are wrong, but this is just a, a test, uh, just to connect it up quickly to make sure that it works. So the motor's been apart, it's gone back together again. And now what I want to do is check that it sounds okay uh, and that it still works. So let's turn the inverter on. That sounds okay. Let's go up to full speed. And then back again. Well, that sounds pretty good to me. And now the service of the motor is complete. Those bearings have been re-greased. The motor is running nicely and it's ready to go back onto the high-speed head. Now it can't go on at the moment because I'm still servicing the high-speed head and that's given me a bit of trouble. Uh, that will be covered in a future video. Anyway, this is now done. Could you do something like this? Of course you can. And with that, this video is at an end. Take care everybody, I'll see you next time.